are going through a series called Becoming More Like Christ. Amen. And last week, uh, we had the first, uh, first lesson of the first thing we're focusing on, connection with Jesus. Um, and uh, this is the first of the four areas that we're focusing in on on this journey of becoming more like Christ. So that word with, I've underlined it there, uh, is a key word in regards to this connection. Um, with, as we talked about last week, is a preposition. And a preposition is a word that communicates the nature of a relationship between two things. And so how we relate to God, that relationship between us and Him, it matters. God created us to be with Him. In the Garden of Eden, God walked with humanity. And His plan was for humanity to rule over the earth on His behalf. To, to be able to cultivate the order, the beauty, the abundance of Eden throughout the earth. And at the end of humanity as we know it, we looked at this passage last week. I'll look at it again if the slide will forward. It's not working. If you could please forward to the next slide for me. That was backwards. Let's see if we can go forward. Can you go forward one more, please? There we go. All right, at the end of humanity as we know it, we see this. John, who's given the vision from God, says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. At the end of humanity, God's intention is with. That's how He wants us to relate to Him. But we live in between the Garden of Eden and the New Jerusalem in the world of fallen humanity where relationship with God has been broken by sin. And so instead of living a life with God that they were created for, Adam and Eve, they gave in to fear from lies that they were told about God, that, oh, He's holding out on you. If you only knew what He's holding out on. And therefore, they tried to control things themselves. They gave in to that temptation, essentially, that you can be a God as well. You know, most people have a sense that God needs to be a part of their life, but we have trouble relating to Him appropriately because we also live in fear and therefore we want to control our world. So last week we introduced four ways, four other ways of relating to God that might be a problem for us. Last week we looked at life from Christ and life for Christ. This week we'll look at life over and life under. And uh, just a brief reminder, life from Christ. When we talk about fear and control, essentially that's fear. We, we fear that we lack something, wealth or health. And so we try to control our world through treating God like a genie in a bottle. In other words, we desire something, so we go to Him to get it, and then we leave Him until we want something from Him again. The core of relating to Him this way really is self. Everything revolves around me. And we looked at the younger son in Luke 15 as the example of someone who was more interested in what he could get from God than God Himself. Life for Christ was the one that we have a fear of insignificance. So we try to control our world by proving we are worthy of God's love. And the example we looked at was the older son in Luke 15, whose identity was wrapped up in how much he could do for God, rather than his identity being in just being with God as his child. And at the core of that way of relating to God is mission. That's my review from last week. Listen to it if you want more. It's online. 
This morning we're going to cover life over Christ, life under Christ. There are some similarities to last week, but there's enough difference to give them their own attention. And remember, each of these postures or relating or ways of relating to Christ do have some biblical merit, but they also have some danger and ultimately fall short of what we were created for, life with Christ. You know, the title of last week's lesson was Prepositions Matter. And since we didn't finish, I've simply titled this week, Prepositions Still Matter. All right, keep it simple. And as I did last week, again this week, I want to encourage you to let this teaching stretch you. You know, many of us have stated at times that in our relationship with God, things seem stale or routine. And the assumption is we don't want to settle for that. We're doing a series on becoming more like Christ. Do we want to become more like Christ? If so, we need to be stretched. All right, let's talk about life over Christ. Now, this phrase certainly could mean those who barely even acknowledge God. It could mean an atheist, agnostic, someone who lives in secular humanism. In other words, people who have no need for God at all. And those people certainly exist. And the dangers of that way of dismissing God are very real. But I'm going to address that more when we get to our, our second series on conviction from His Word. But since most people in the United States believe in God, 83%, and it varies a little bit depending on how the question is worded, but in the mid-80s percent believe in God. And since that's where we live, today I'm, I want to address this posture of life over Christ within a Christian context. And the dangers in that context are still there, although a little bit more subtle. Because although most people still believe in God, most don't have a biblical view of God. Rather, what many ascribe to is what's really known as deism. Meaning, God exists, and He created the universe, but He is distant and relatively uninvolved in the matters of ordinary life. And it's not hard to see how with would be a hard posture for someone who views God that way. You know, to remind you of the definition we threw out last week of this. This is where God, we, we, our, our, our relationship is that God has set the principles for how the world works, then leaves us to follow them or not. In other words, again, an impersonal God. We primarily relate to God by figuring out how the world works and then implementing the right principles. This posture sees God as the proverbial watchmaker, meaning He's made the watch, and once we've figured out how the watch works, why do you still need a relationship with the watchmaker? Likewise, if we can just figure out the principles of success or effectiveness or the good life, however we want to define those things, then why do we really need the one who created life? You know, the fear of life over Christ is a fear of failure. So we try to control our world through figuring out God's secret to success. Now, like all of the postures, there is some biblical merit, or good if you would, and that's simply the fact that there are principles from God that are pleasing to Him and communicated clearly in Scripture. We see things like honesty, unity, servitude, humility, generosity. We could go on. However, there are more, many dangers to this posture. And the first one I've listed is that this way of relating to God reduces relationship with Him to making sure we have the correct principles, but without necessarily walking with Him. Maybe at best we'll give Him a thank you for giving us such wise principles by which to live. And to make this into like a human analogy, like my children, there are principles I've tried to instill in them as they grow up. And my son has moved away from home now. And I even had a, li I had a list. We had this thing that was up on a board of the things to cover before the kids move out of the house, you know? And I feel like we did a fairly good job trying to prepare him for life. And I hope he's following those principles. But that's not all I want from him. It's not like, okay, you're gone now. Following the principles, cool. I want a relationship with him. I still want to communicate with him. When I get a text, even just a text, from him, 
and it's telling me something about his life, it's the light of my day. It is. Because sure, I've left the principles, but that's not the end of our relationship. You know, this type of posture toward Christ will likely be accompanied by very little prayer. Because we've figured things out. We've found the secret to success in tried and true principles. There's no need to waste time praying. You, if, if, if you function from that posture, you may even right now be going, okay, how long are you going to go? Jeez, just give me the three principles before I leave. <laughs> just, just go to your last slide, the application. Do I really need to listen to you for the next 30 minutes? You know? Um, you do. Because I could go to the last slide, but my goal isn't just for you to have principles. It's for us to relate to God in the way He created us too. In case this idea is not making sense, let's look at an example from the Scriptures where a principle overshadowed an actual connection with God and the consequences that came from that. And we're going to look at Moses to do that. Most of us are familiar with Moses. You know, God had used Moses to free His people from slavery in Egypt. And the staff that God had given Moses had played a big role in it. You know the story. God threw the staff and He took it back up. That staff is what was used to turn the Nile into blood. From water to blood. And it was that very staff that He used to part the Red Sea. And then, of course, they, he frees them. They're in the desert. And the people start complaining to Moses for water. We're going to be in Exodus 17, if you're following along there. In Exodus 17, uh, as the people are complaining for water, Moses goes to be with God and asks God, God, what do I do? And we'll pick up where God answers him. Verse 5, the Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And so God tells him, strike the rock with that staff. He does it. I didn't write the rest, but water does come out, and... Awesome. Great success, right? Well, now we're going to look at Numbers 20. Because a little while later, the people complained again for water. Moses once again goes to God. God, what do I do? And this time we'll pick up with the Lord's answer in Numbers 20, verse 7. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before the eyes, before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses spoke to that rock. Ah, no, he didn't. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out in the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, what did they do that wasn't trusting him? He struck it instead of speaking. It says, because of that, you will not bring this community into the land that I give them. See, this time God says, speak to the rock and the water will come out. But Moses, who had lived through many examples of the staff being the answer, decides to strike the rock instead of speak to it as God has instructed him when he went to commune with God. Why do you have to strike it twice? I don't know. Maybe because it didn't come out the first time? I, I, I don't know. But I do know that ultimately he went with a principle that had worked before over his communion with God. He put the faith in the proverbial watch instead of the watch maker. And the result was not pleasing to God. And we might go, but wasn't it successful? It was. 
Water did come out of the rock. So we would likely deem what he did successful, but God's not pleased. I mean, in our day, we'd probably hire Moses to lead a seminar on the most effective principles for drawing water from rocks. You know, that, the, the, this idea or, or this example leads me to two more dangers of this posture I want to share. And, and these are progressive, meaning that the first one I share can lead to the second one. Let's start with the first one. At best, at its best, life over God results in a relationship with the Bible rather than a relationship with the author of the Bible. Again, at its best, life over God results in a relationship with the Bible rather than a relationship with the author of the Bible. Let's look in John 5 for an example of this. In John 5, Jesus speaking here in verse 39 says, You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Remember when started this year, John 17, Jesus' prayer? This is eternal life that you know God and His Son Jesus. It says, you say the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about Me, yet you refuse to come to Me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I've come in My Father's name and you don't accept Me. But if someone else comes in His own name, you will accept Him. Jesus is speaking to the Jewish leaders of that time and they were masters at searching the Scriptures to then create principles for life. I mean, they had written over time 39 different chapters of principles to help obey one command, observe the Sabbath. And these guys were masters at creating principles, but their study of Scripture did not result in them knowing God. Jesus says, you refuse to come to Me. They didn't even recognize God as He was standing right in front of them, speaking to them. And Jesus says the fruit of knowing God, a life of love, did not exist in them. Now please do not take this as me diminishing the importance of Scripture. In no way am I doing that. We're going to spend an entire month on conviction from His Word. Absolutely believe the Scriptures are the Word of God and necessary for our lives. But a key to this posture is that the Bible, yes, it does contain principles for life and faith. But it's also where God Himself has chosen to reveal Himself. And one of the things He reveals is His desire to be with us. So why are we primarily reading the Scriptures? Just to gather some principles for success? Or to know the one who's the author of those things? You know, this particular posture is especially prevalent in affluent professional communities. Because the expectation of efficiency in all things leads us to a desire for simple and quick solutions. See, the same people who read seven habits of a highly successful people want the efficiency of five foolproof habits of a close relationship to God. And the three principles to guarantee spiritual leadership and the four steps to a perfect family. But here's the thing. Relationships are not simple and quick. A relationship with God, think about it. I mean, God in some ways, is very predictable. He's faithful. We're told Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And yet in other ways, He's mysterious. He says, my ways are not your ways. They're so much greater than your ways. My thoughts so much greater than yours. So a relationship with Him, rather than being simple and quick, requires listening, requires wrestling, in prayer requires dealing with the mess in our own hearts. I mean, how do we even measure success spiritually? 
I mean, in John 5, that example there, those Pharisees, those religious leaders had risen to the top of their profession, but didn't even recognize God. They were hateful. They were judgmental. They were spiteful rather than loving like God and yet successful in every measure of their day. I mentioned it was a progressive danger. So that was the one that I said that at best we settle for a relationship with the Bible rather than a relationship with the author of the Bible. But Jesus said in that last verse that I had up there in verse 43, he said, you, you accept people who come in their own name even though I'm coming from the Father and you don't accept me. And so the progression we can go from that danger is to this danger. At worst, if the principles we find in the Bible do not produce the results we want, then it becomes very easy to replace them with other principles. Because with God was never the goal. And that's why this posture leads to the agnosticism, atheism, secular humanism. Again, how do we measure success or effectiveness or the good life? In the case of Moses, was it water coming out of the rock or was it being faithful to God? Water came out effective, but he betrayed God's ways, which he must not have thought would work, and it cost him entering the promised land. Why did God say strike the rock one time and speak to it the other time? I have no idea. But that's part of the beauty of God. See, we want to be able to control God. But He's uncontrollable. He's mysterious. Again, His ways greater than our ways, thoughts greater than our thoughts. You know, church leaders, of which I am, can be the worst at this. You know, an influential, very influential church leader of our time, Andy Stanley, was asked by a Christian publication that was interviewing him, asked him, what's distinctly spiritual about the kind of leadership you do and train. And this was his response. There is nothing distinctly spiritual. One of the criticisms I get is that your church is so corporate. And I say, you're right. Why is that such a bad model? A principle is a principle. And God created all the principles. In other words, he's saying, who cares if the principles are from God? I'm going to do what quote unquote works. See, we can subtly abandon connection with God for proven formulas and controllable outcomes. And if you think this example, I just picked something that is exaggerating it. Barna Research took a poll of 614 pastors in the United States, giving them 12 ministry focus options and said, from these, which of these are your top three priorities in the coming year? Prayer was one of the 12. Prayer ranked last. Only 3% of the 614 United States pastors picked prayer as one of their three top three ministry focus for the new year. So like 19 of the 614, if I've done that math right in my head. It's amazing to me how quick church leaders are to turn to Brené Brown or some other business leadership books or military strategies for church strategies just because someone else has had quote-unquote success with it instead of relying on the life and teachings of Jesus and wrestling with God in prayer. And yes, I can give in to it too. Success is seductive. But how do we measure it? And this can apply to a myriad of life situations, not just spiritual leadership. This this can apply in marriage. This can apply to our parenting. I think about parenting. If you've ever been a place where, man, I've been trying God's ways of parenting my kids, but they just won't listen. But if I get angry at them, if I yell at them, if I threaten them, they listen. So that must be successful, right? Well, if you're measuring success that way. Ultimately, as I studied this one out, I saw that life over Christ is not the same as life with Christ and can even result in life without Christ because the goal was never Christ in the first place, but rather success. Is anything we gain really success if it's absent from Him? Some food for thought on this one before we go to life under Christ. If you want to take a picture, we're covering this in our midweek. 
uh, meetings this week. Do I read the Scriptures more to know the principles for success or to get to know God better? If so, how is this affecting my connection with Him? Is there an area of life that I rarely pray to God for discernment but simply rely on my own ability to figure things out? If so, what area? And finally, is there an area of life where I've abandoned God's ways because it did not seem like they were working? Explain. Life under Christ. You know, this one, much like life for Christ, if you were here last week, at first glance can seem, well, what's wrong with that? You know? Because unlike what we just talked about, life over Christ, this posture actually believes he's intimately involved in our lives. A definition of this one, this posture sees God in simple cause and effect terms. He's very involved in our lives. We obey his commands and he blesses us. We disobey them, he punishes us. We relate to him primarily by obeying in order to solicit blessing and avoid punishment. You know, I'd give you an example of what I mean by cause and effect. So when I was leading a church in California many years ago, this was actually the year. I'm a Rams fan. Appreciate the divisional playoffs, all that kind of stuff. My team plays today too, but um, uh, Rams fan. And so this was the year they actually won the Super Bowl. And uh, they started that year like 7-0, 8-0. I was in Southern California. They were in St. Louis at the time. There were no Rams fans in Southern California. It was me, and then there was this brother... I won't use his name. In, in our fellowship there, we were both Rams fans. That was it. And so I remember it was like 7-0, 8-0 that season, start the year off. And the Tennessee Titans were also like 7-0 to start the year. And we were playing each other. Big game. West Coast, game was starting at 10 a.m. We were on the road in Tennessee. And um, I'm at church and we're singing, whatever. And I'm looking, I'm like, Tim's not here. You know? And in my head, I'm like, he better not have stayed at home to watch the game. He's going to curse us, you know? And then he, he didn't come, so I left this back before everyone had cell phones. So I went over to his apartment to make sure he was okay. And I knocked on the door. He answered the door. I'm like, you okay, man? He's like, kind of head down. He's like, yeah. He's like, I stayed home to watch the game. <laughs> I was like, well, how'd it go? He goes, we lost. I'm like, man. He's like, I know we lost because I stayed home. I'll never stay home again to <laughs> miss again. And, and and I don't know if either one of us really believe that, but you can. That, but that's what I mean by simple cause and effect. Oh, I did this, so that happened. You know, it is fairly egocentric that, okay, yeah, that happened because one person stayed home, whatever. That, that's a whole nother story. But life under Christ, what's it a fear? It's a fear of calamity. So we try to control our world by appeasing God through our obedience or sacrifice, or worship, or however you want to word that. Uh, I've shared many times about my fear of flying, and this has made me think, is this really the root of my fear of flying? Mm, I'm going to have to examine that in my heart. But this definitely can have some biblical merit. This posture absolutely has some. God does give us commands that we are expected to obey. In general, obedience is promised with blessing, and we are warned of consequences for disobedience. Danger, though. The danger is that we try to use our obedience to God as a way to control Him. We think God owes us in exchange for our worship, morality, or sacrifice. You know, for an example of this, since we're talking about football, on November 28, 2010, the Buffalo Bills were playing the Pittsburgh Steelers, which means Roy Lancey was probably watching this game. <clears throat> With the game tied at 16 in overtime, the Buffalo quarterback, Ryan Pitch. Fitzpat Fitzpatrick, Fitzmagic, dro drops back to pass, launches a pass from about the 40-yard line, and perfect pass to the wide receiver St Steve Johnson in the end zone. Johnson, both hands, drops it. Steelers end up getting the ball back, drive for the winning touchdown later in overtime, and Roy was probably rejoicing. After the game, this is what Steve Johnson posted on Twitter. I praise you 24-7, and this is how you do me? You expect me to learn from this? How? I'll never forget this, ever. Thanks, though. This is a prime example of a life under Christ response. I worshipped you, so you owe me, and you didn't follow through on your end of the deal. And I don't share this to any way 
defame this guy, but rather simply to give us a real-life example of what I think many of us can probably relate to. Not necessarily in the football aspect, but in the aspect of, at times, feeling like God owes us something and didn't come through, even though I obeyed you, God. I sacrificed for you. You know, when we're in a posture like Johnson's, we may claim... See, see, even that phraseology is kind of wrong. We may claim that we're living under His authority, but that's not really lordship. Lordship requires surrender to Him, not just manipulative worship or morality or sacrifice. Because really all this is is a pious way of trying to control Him. We've got to be careful with this very simple cause and effect expectation. I'm not going to turn to these, but... A couple of examples. Acts 12. In Acts 12, James, the apostle, died at the hands of Herod, while Peter, the apostle, was miraculously released from prison. Roy preached about that not too long ago. Yet both of them had been faithful to the calling from Christ to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. So, did God owe James a miraculous freeing from prison as well? Was he showing favoritism to Peter? Some may argue, well, (laughs) maybe James got the favoritism. He he got to go be with God. (laughs) Hebrews 11. At the end of Hebrews 11, uh, we see this list in verse 32 through 38 of a wide variety of results for faithful men and women of God. It even states that some of them escaped the sword. Miraculously, while some of them died by the sword, did God owe either of them something different for their faithfulness? You know, first off, God owes us nothing except what He promises, and that's because He is faithful. Hey, God never promised Steve Johnson success at football, but He was being held to it. But even the promises He does make, it's not that He owes us as much as His mercy is being extended to us. We can never earn from God. Secondly, we need to be careful that we don't try to hold Him to promises He's never made or extend those promises to other people. You know how you make promises to other people? Oh, if you just do... You want them to follow God, so you make them a promise of what will happen in their life if they do that God never made? Stay pure, and you'll get married and have a godly marriage. Does God promise that? Rather, we should stay pure out of love for the One who created us and knows what's best for us. Or be honest, and your business or your career or your school will succeed. Not Not promised. But rather be honest because the one we get to be with loves honesty. And see, when we try to do that, okay, now how's someone going to respond if it doesn't come through? Well, then it becomes natural to, like this guy, put blame on God when life doesn't go the way we hoped, even though He's not even promised what we're holding Him to. A key to this one. This doesn't mean God's moral instructions are bad or should be ignored. It's clear in Scripture that God issues His commands for our benefit and protection. What is at issue is not God's goodness or wisdom, but rather how we relate to Him. In Titus 2, we're told, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It, the grace of God, Not fear of calamity. Not manipulation of Him. The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, and to purify for Himself a people that are His very own, eager to do 
what is good. Eager to do what is good. Why? Because of the grace of God. See, our obedience comes from joy of a relationship with a God who has loved us deeply, has shown us incredible mercy, who gave Himself to redeem us from our deformed ways of relating to Him rather than a place of manipulation or control or a fear of punishment or calamity, we have the grace of God, a God who's given His life for us. You know, I mentioned last week that this, the whole premise for this study that we're doing is from a book from a guy named Akash Jathani or Sky Jathani. And um, this is actually a quote from him from the book. He says, Any way of relating to God predicated on fear and fighting for control cannot deliver us from what plagues humanity, namely fear and fighting for control. You know, the last danger I want to mention here, if we function from a posture of fearing God and trying to avoid calamity, obedience can easily become a checklist of outward ritual that completely misses the heart. And let's look at Jesus' words again to the religious leaders of His time in Matthew 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean to make it relevant to us. Did I read my Bible? Check. Did I go to church? Check. Did I give my tithe? Check. Okay, good. Don't neglect those things. But what about the matters of the heart? Justice, mercy, faithfulness. Do we deal with the sin in our hearts? Or are we just making sure the outside of the cup looks clean? You know, the best spiritual practice or discipline as we're in a season of talking of those things for keeping in step with the Spirit in this matter that I know of is confession, regular confession of what is going on in the heart, both to God and to people who will walk with God with us. Because Jesus says, clean the inside first. Don't just try to look good on the outside. Here's some food for thought on this one. And we'll cover this at our midweeks as well. Do I ever feel like there's anything God owes me? Explain. Secondly, am I more motivated to obey God by fear or guilt? Or is it love and grace? explain. And lastly, is there any part of my walk with Christ that's become more ritual than heart? If so, commit yourself to the regular practice of confession with a trusted friend to navigate your heart. You know, um, there's a song uh, called Jacob from um, Chris Renzema. I shared a song from him a couple weeks ago, but in it he says, he says, I know that there is a cure for this sickness my heart endures. But it's hard to walk naked into the light. And I know that vulnerability with the inner junk of our hearts can be hard. But this spiritual practice helps bring that cleaning of the inside of the cup, that healing Jesus wants for us. Has anything resonated with you from the last two weeks? From, for, over, under? What are you afraid of? What are you trying to control? I know for me, I shared last week, life for Christ, that's me to a T. I struggle some with the life under Christ, for sure. You know, as we've stated, even if we're in the good spots of these ways of relating to Christ, the place we were created for is life with Christ. Because see, the goal of all those four is something from Him. 
but the goal of life with Christ is Him. You know, do you remember from a couple weeks ago that list of practices and disciplines that we put up? You know, these are not practices just for the sake of having a habit. The idea is that these are ways to help us keep in step with the Spirit who lives in us. God is with us. And note, confession's on there. It's one of them. Hey, have you implemented any? Are any of these helping you be with Him throughout your days? For me, the things that are helping, Scripture memory is helping me keep His voice prevalent throughout my day when I'm battling the stories that try to draw me away from Christ. I got three more this week. Four now. I have a fourth one this morning. A new one that's helping me. I've mentioned the idea of practice of three times a day prayer for me. Honestly, it's, it's transformed beyond that now. Now it's just prayer throughout the day. Because the three times a day was building in me a desire to pray throughout the day, and now it's become that. You know, I shared last week that I had just started the prayer of examine uh, that was helping with awareness of God's present throughout different events of my day, at least in retrospect. If you don't know what I'm talking about, talk to me after, or it's in last week's lesson. But um, I'm seeing more moments of like Jacob in Genesis 28, 16, when he says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't realize it. Having more of those moments. I have a new idea I've been working on this week. It's called Lectio Divina, uh, practiced for many centuries. I'm not at a place to share that with you yet. I'm, I'm experimenting with something. Uh, I talked to Cordell a little bit about the other day, and I don't know, maybe I'll share about it in my group at midweek. But all right, application for this week. Answer the food for thought questions from today's lesson. What are the practices that are helping you experience life with Christ? And be prepared to share these at our midweek gatherings this week. Next week, Cordell is going to be looking more in depth. He, he has, he has the, the, uh, the difficult task of looking more in depth at with, Christ. Life with Christ. I'm looking forward to that. But this morning, before we take the Lord's Supper, remembering the one we're striving to become more like, I like to quote, close with another quote from the author of the book uh, that this came from. And it's this. Fulfilling God's desire to be with us is why Jesus went to the cross. He did not die merely to inaugurate a mission, life for Christ or to give us a second chance at life, life from Christ. He did not endure the horrors of the cross just to demonstrate a principle of love for others to emulate, life over Christ, or to appease divine wrath, life under Christ. While each of these may be rooted in truth and affirmed by Scripture, it is only when we grasp God's unyielding desire to be with us that we can begin to see the ultimate purpose of the cross. It's more than a vehicle to rescue us from death. It transports us into the arms of life with Him. The cross is how we acquire our treasure. Him. It is how we find unity with Him.